Welcome back to the Mission 43 podcast. I'm Brian Von Herbulis, the director of Mission 43. And as the country is still wrestling with COVID-19 and many folks are sheltering in place still with light at the end of that tunnel, hopefully, uh, we are continuing our Veteran Leaders series where we've gone virtual and continue to bring veteran leaders from around the country to you, our Mission 43 podcast listeners. So today, I'm excited to bring Jen Anthony onto the podcast. Jen is a retired Air Force Chief Master Sergeant. She is currently the Managing Director for Information Technologies at Lorian Health Services. She is an executive coach. She's a single mom. And she's also a George W. Bush Institute Veteran Leadership Scholar. So, Jen Anthony, welcome to the Mission 43 podcast. Thank you, Brian. It is fabulous to be here, and I'm super excited about spending a little bit of time with you today. So what does the day in the life of Jen Anthony in COVID-19, you know, managing director, high-level position in corporate America, and single mom, what's a day look like for you right now? It is uh, a little bit of grit and a whole lot of grace and a whole lot of gratitude. Um, This is really hard, Brian. This is really hard for everyone who's going through this, right? But now I'm working from home. Both of my kids are in school from home. Uh, I felt this immense pressure to continue to be productive and successful. Uh, And some of that was self-imposed, right? Um, But here's the deal. Here's where I am. We are 30 four days into this where we haven't left our homes and um, and I'm okay with whatever the day brings to us. So Brian, some days are really good. I'm doing really well at work. My team is doing really well at work. Kids are super productive. We're taking a walk. We're getting some exercise and some days uh, they're not good. And I'm, you know, I got tears rolling down my face and I have a cocktail staring out my back window wondering if we're going to be able to survive another day. So we're doing the best we can, like everybody else is dealing with us. Yeah, I, uh, I'm i looking forward to the light I see at the end of the tunnel. You know, I know most states are starting to release their plan to, to reopen, rebuild, get back at it. Uh, and people need it, right? So uh, it's exciting to see. But, um, you know, certainly, Jen, that accent you have is not one that's heard very often here in the Pacific Northwest. Um where Mission 43 resides in the great state of Idaho. So tell me a little bit about um, where you're from, where'd you grow up, and then let's get into uh, your military background a little bit. Uh, I am happy to share that. Let me caveat what I'm about to say with this. I love Idaho. It is my favorite place to snowboard. So hopefully your team that's listening, that resonates with them. Uh, I grew up in a small town in South Mississippi, Um, single mom. My dad was an Army veteran. I lost him very young. Uh, My dad's side of the family lived in New Orleans. Um, No one in my immediate family, Brian, had a high school education. So no one in my immediate family graduated high school. I think that probably paints a picture for what growing up looked like for me. So how did you find the Air Force? What what led you down that path? So after two years in a local community, I did pretty well. I was a good student. I was a student athlete, finished high school, went to two years of community college. But even that was really taxing. So I was an athlete in college. I was taking a course, a a whole course full of schoolwork. And I was waiting tables, Brian. And after two years, I'm like, I'm exhausted. And this is hard. And I'm, I'm not moving forward. So like a lot of things I do in my life, Brian, I made a very quick decision that I was driving to see an Air Force recruiter. For whatever reason, it was only an Air Force recruiter at that building. I walked in, Master Sergeant Tony Woods said, so do you want to talk about joining the Air Force? And I said, no, I want to sign whatever I need to sign and I'm ready to go. And 22 days later, I was on my first plane ride out of South Mississippi into the Air Force. So major transition in life, 
you jumped right in with both feet, uh, looking for new opportunities, maybe escaping the place you were, and you found those opportunities in the United States Air Force. So what, what occupational specialty, like what career field did you pursue in the Air Force? So I'm a little bit of a, of a career jumper. So in 20 years, Brian, I held five different MOSs or AFSCs. So I started out doing computer operations. I became an instructor, a, a pipeline instructor, first for folks that were just coming out of basic training to learn their craft. Um, and then I moved to more senior level um, instruction for folks that had been in the service a while that were honing specific skills. Master that, I was ready for something new. Um, project management was open in the, in the Air Force. So I said, you know, let me take a hack at that and see if I can do that. The Air Force at the time, you know, you, ha you have to align those goals with what the needs of the service were. And at the time they were like, yep, we need project managers. So I did that for a couple of years. And, and um, I had a couple of mentors who had served as first sergeants. And one of those guys um, kind of pinned me to the wall and said, hey, I think you'd be really good at being a first sergeant. So he helped me walk through that process and put my name in the hat. I did that for four years. Super, super, super awesome experience. And then I spent my last four years doing offensive and defensive cyber operations. When I got promoted to E8, they were like, you got to come back to your specialty. And at the time, um, that was pretty sexy work, offensive and defensive cyberspace operations. It still is pretty sexy work. So I was happy to go do that too. So you chose for the most part, a career path that had opportunities post-military service. I mean, it's not like you were like many of the folks I served alongside infantrymen, you know, where a lot of those skills just don't necessarily transition. So you, you chose well, you lined yourself up for post-military life with a, a set of skills, both from a probably human capital, human relations uh, arena with your, your four-year assignment as a first sergeant. And then you had real tangible cyber skills that you could transfer to civilian life. So uh, well done from building a career path, right? Um, well, thanks. <laughs> but like... I had no idea that that's what was happening. I mean, Brian, you and I can sit and, and um, I think hindsight's a beautiful gift. And, and that looks like it was well planned and well thought out. Uh, but if I'm being honest with you, it was by sheer luck, divine intervention, good people. I didn't do that. Right. So from a time standpoint, like what year did you join the Air Force? In 98, 1998. Okay. And then what year did you pin on first sergeant? It was pretty early in my career. I'd been in 14 years. So a little bit of a fast track to uh, to that rank. For sure. And then um, at that point, you know, how did you um, how did you respond to the new assignments as a first sergeant? Did you enjoy that role? I mean, you did it for four years. I loved it. It was really hard. So think about this, right? I'm a small town girl. I joined the military. I spend my first 10 years, like traveling and doing some cool stuff, doing some cool work. And then I become a first sergeant. And here's the thing about the Air Force, Brian, is that we take our first sergeants and we put them in units unassociated with their MOS. Okay. Right? Because the focus for the first sergeant is the people. We don't want you to get in the way of the mission. We got people to do that. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So my first unit was a flying unit. A pretty small flying unit, and it was a hoot. That's the first time I'd worked in a unit that had a bar <laughs> in the building. Yeah. Um, it's the first time I had really significant exposure to missions outside of what I'd known for the first 12, 14 years in the Air Force. And it was easy. That was a really easy unit. But because I did so well, <laughs> my reward was a 650 person aircraft maintenance unit. Mm, that sounds fun. So I, listen, this is my first day on the job and I promise you, I'm not making this up. I take my little box for my operations unit. I drive over to the other side of the base. 
I walk in the door and there are two senior NCOs. Uh, so I have to walk down a long hallway to get to my office. And Brian, they are going at it. I mean, I think I feel like these two guys are about to go out back and just go fist to cuff, right? I'm walking down the hall and no one's even blinking an eye. It's as if it's normal. So I pass the office of the chiefs. So at this time, I'm an E7. There are four E9s in that office. And they're the 30-year, been working on aircraft, pushing toolboxes, tough work. I mean, these guys have been doing tough work, right? Yeah. And here I come. Yeah. Bebopping down the hall. <laughs> old country with my big smile on in my little box. And I remember one of the chiefs looks out. You know, he just kind of peers out the out his door and he says, what the hell are you doing here? And the only thing I could say to him is, well, chief, I work here. I'm your new first sergeant. And I mean, I could just, he was just seething. I make it to my desk, Brian, the phone rings. I pick up the phone. It's security forces asking me if a particular guy belongs to my unit. I've been there five minutes. So I, I scream across the hall. I'm like, Hey, does John Smith work here? And, um, and sure enough, he does. And, and here was the news is that his wife had passed away in base housing. This guy was on a flight line working on an A-10 and their four children were in the house. That was my first day on the job in that unit. And I promise you for two years, every single day felt just like that. That's good stuff. <laughs> Let, did you ever have like the FBI's motorcycle outlaw gang task force show up at your office? Um, no. What I at the time I was stationed in Tucson, Arizona. And what I really appreciated about being there is when someone was arrested, they would keep them overnight. So I never had to go to Pima County Corrections Facility at 3 a.m., uh, but I went frequently on Saturday and Sunday mornings at 8 a.m., so much so, you know, they knew me by name. They knew what kind of coffee I was going to drink. Yeah. Yeah, that um, sounds like you would have had a good time in the Marine Corps, too. You would have been dealing with similar problems. Um, the reason I asked about the Outlaw Motorcycle Gang Task Force is that that was one of my most interesting experiences. They showed up randomly at our command and asked to talk to me and they showed me a whole portfolio of Marines and asked if I knew any of them and then started talking to me about potentially some of the things they were involved in and uh, it just blew my mind some of the things happening in and around with people that I knew and had known for a long time. So understanding full well the job of a first sergeant, and it's a people business, right? And yeah. your role for a long time was taking care of people to, to the magnitude and degree possible, um, sometimes to prevent them from harming themselves in a professional way. Um, so kudos to you for executing those duties uh, but really challenging to understand your role in that and understanding how important that role is because they're all vital to the service. They're all vital to the command. They're all vital to, you know, at that point, probably protracted combat operations uh, and everybody needed to execute their job. So your task was really to keep them in tune with the work they were doing, the vital critical work they were doing and make sure they showed up to work on time and got their job done. On time and sober. You need yeah. To on time and sober. Okay, so um, you you spent your four years as a first sergeant, and then you're moving up the ranks. Uh, you made it to the pinnacle. So you became a chief in the Air Force. Um, what, what made you decide to retire and leave the Air Force? Brian, I think like a lot of people, it wasn't one thing. It was it was a crux of a number of things that happened seemingly at the same time. So the first thing was that I was becoming disheartened at some of the things that I, that I was seeing around me. Now, listen, like we know service in the military, it's not all rainbows and Skittles. But for the first time in my career, I started to feel like I couldn't positively impact a change in areas where I saw there was a problem. So that was one thing that was happening. 
here's the second thing that was happening. Like, there's no E10, right? Like, I'm an E9. I've, I've been serving 20 years. They pull, they pull me over to do important staff work in a building with, you know, GS-15s and, and O6s and above. There are no young people there. And that, that's really what motivated me. So when I thought about the next 10 years of serving in the Air Force and that it might look like that, that was disheartening to me. Another reason was um, I, I'm a single mom and I have strung two really awesome kids along for 20 years. My son was facing um, his third change of high school at his junior year. So essentially what would have happened to him is a different high school all four years of high school. And, and, I, and I thought that that was enough, right? And then the last thing is this, Brian. Early in my career, I worked for a really smart dude. So this guy was an F-16 pilot and an MD, a doctor. Okay. And, I, and he hit me up one day. Um, I was serving as a first sergeant at the time, and he hit me up. He came in my office and shut the door, and he's like, I don't understand why you're giving everything you have to the Air Force. Like, you leave at the end of the day, and you don't have room for anything else. He said, you know, he's like, what's your plan? What's your five-year plan? What are you going to do after the military? And at the time, that conversation, re- it pissed me off, right, because I couldn't see past serving in the Air Force. And um, one thing he said to me really stuck with me is um, – he said, you have the capability to do so much in this world. He said, you're going to be a chief by the time you get to 20 years. He said, if you stay in the Air Force another 10 years, you rob yourself of gaining the experience and having the capability to serve this world, right, in a different way. And I don't know why that stuck with me, Brian, but it did. And so as I started, as I jumped moved over the 20 year hump, those words that he echoed to me much earlier in my career, I I could just hear them more loudly. Okay. But ultimately you made the decision to depart, retire from the air force after achieving, you know, again, what I consider to be the pinnacle. Like you, you reached E9 and you're a woman in uniform who reaches that rank, which I assume in the air force is a pretty small percentage. Is that you know, would you say that's true? One percent. Okay, so one <laughs> percent. That's mandated by Congress. <clears throat> that's uh, a really small group of women executing duties at the rank of E nine in the Air Force. Then, um, so you make it that far, but you've made a conscious decision. You're going to move on in the world. So, how did you? You know, Mission Forty Three at its core, uh, to take a step back for a second, is a transition support organization. You know, we help military veterans in Idaho prepare themselves for uh, finding opportunities post-military service, uh, whether that's employment or education. How did you prepare yourself for this pending transition that that you had made the decision to step out into? The first thing I will tell you is that I I got a lot of things wrong. So I made a lot of assumptions about transition that were wrong. The first assumption I made was transition is just finding a job. If I land a good job, then I've successfully transitioned. Wrong. I yeah. mean, that was, that was about as wrong as it gets, right? But, but understand, I prepared for transition in that way. So what I will tell you, Brian, is I took advantage. I was really thorough. Uh, I took advantage of all the programs that were available to me through the Air Force, with TAP. I did TAP a couple times. I had executive TAP. Uh, I retired out of San Antonio, Military City USA. They have a really robust network of VSOs, volunteers, coaches, all kind of programs that that you can use to transition so, and all awesome. I did tons of workshops, tons of in- informational interviews. I also did the USO Pathfinder program, which okay. was awesome. Um, and I took advantage of the career uh, skill bridge program, right? That's where you take, you know, your last six months, um, which was, which was super important because I thought I was going to sell real estate, but good thing that I did that program because what I learned is that I'm not 
good at real estate. And so <laughs> back to the drawing board we go. And Brian, you know, you know the adage, right? I had so many advocates helping me find my next job and I was successful doing that. I was successful landing a really great job in an area where, um, you know, where I've, where I've been able to be with people who help me uh, find a new job and settle into a new place. Pretty easy. Was the transition that you experienced different though? I mean, was it challenging in other ways? You, you land what appears on the surface to be a great job. You executed everything the service provided. You found networks to work your way through the transition. Uh, what was missing? What, what was the outcome? What happened? So I failed in, I made a lot of assumptions. I failed in taking stock and, and, realizing that transition was going to be so mo so much more than finding a job. So Brian, I, I had a six day break from camos and combat boots to a business suit in a boardroom, six days. Wow. That was not a smart move. Yeah. I at least took a vacation, took the family to Hawaii, you know, like took 30 days off before jumping into corporate America. So six days is a pretty quick transition uh, to, to a whole new lifestyle. But I think it sh so one thing I would say is that that was necessary for me, right? Remember, single mom, I don't know if you've checked retired, E9 pay lately. Um, it was necessary that I secure employment. Right. <clears throat> but it robbed me of the, of the capability to really ingest and be present to what was going on. So what happened, Brian, is I landed in a job. I, I came into a role where they wanted me to fix stuff. Pfft, awesome. That's yeah. exactly what I do. Right. And so gr great people, right. I'm one of the only veterans in the company at the time. I'm with people who don't get me. I really don't get them. I'm trying to figure out my, my space in the world. Uh, literally I'm struggling with like, what am I going to wear to work today? So at about the six month point, the um, emergency that I've been brought in to resolve has been resolved, right? I built a team, we set up some goals, we assess where our risk was, we put some processes into place, boom, six months later, things are running like a well-oiled machine. And then, and then I was faced with this overwhelming feeling. I can put words to it now, Brian, I could not then. Uh, it was grief. It was loss. It was loss of purpose, loss of direction. I felt like I was just kind of going through the motions. Um, and it scared the daylights out of me. Um, and at that moment, I wasn't talking to anyone about the way I felt. Uh, gratitude super important to me. And so what I, I was making myself feel guilty about feeling this way. You had a successful career in the Air Force. You have this great job. Like, get it together. What what else could you want? Um, and it, it was a reckoning for me, that's for sure. Yeah, I, I somewhat share a similar story. You know, had a job waiting for me. I took a sweet vacation. But... Um, much like you, I was brought into a company to fix things. They needed somebody to help scale the company, run operations, be analytical about the, their last 20 years of, of work in a particular industry and bring new life into the company and new process. So much like you, six months into it, we fixed all that, at least in my <laughs> mind. You know, we, we're sailing and I was miserable. I was bored at this point. The job I was brought to do, you know, that was a short lived purpose. And once things were in place and moving, I felt like my purpose was no longer to be found. Um, and it was eating away at me every day uh, where on the surface, it looked like transition was perfect. I landed a sweet job. I'm making good money. And Family seems happy. They didn't have to leave. We stayed in the same house we were living in when I retired. They stayed in the same school. Everything seemed great. 
Um, but I was not a happy person. I was l at a loss of identity, loss of purpose, working in a career field that I saw no meaning or longevity to happiness in it. And I was desperately dying inside looking for something more. So I, that's why when you and I met um, and we kind of understood each other's story a little bit, uh, it resonated to me how difficult the transition can be, uh, especially for those that have spent an entire career in the military. You know, we analyze at Mission 43 our different demographics, right? We've got those young NCOs that are transitioning maybe at the five, four to, you know, 10 year mark and they leave the service. Um, but there are so many programs and opportunities on the surface that they could explore. Like never has this country provided so many opportunities through veteran transition programs, through things like SkillsBridge, um, all these things that are out there. But when you're in your 40s, you've done something for so long, it's all you've ever known professionally, you're now stepping out into the big blue ocean of corporate America, wondering where in the world you fit in. And I think businesses think that too. So you might land what appears to be a good job, you might be one of the lucky ones, but how many folks who, who land there are actually happy in what they're doing? Where do they find purpose? And that's the question I get asked all the time. Where do I find purpose in my life post-career in the, you know, post-military career? And that's a, that's a hard thing to, to help people answer. Um, so I want to talk a little bit more about this transition process because you found yourself, I found myself struggling at that six-month mark in corporate America on where do we go? Where do we find it? Uh, and I want to... I want to know what kind of what steps did you take at that point? What what transpired, Jen? So Brian, I'll tell you this. Uh, here's something I was not prepared for. I, I think transition for everyone is really hard. I think for women, it's different because I was not prepared to defend my service. Suddenly, um, I wasn't prepared. When I told people that uh, that I retired from the military or when my boss, my boss is like a super, super proud to have hired a veteran, right? And, and he would share that with people. Um, the response I would get is, you don't look like a veteran. And that, in that moment, that was so painful and so heartbreaking because I just spent 20 years, my life dedicated to service all over the world, Iraq, Afghanistan, right? And, and now someone who I don't know is saying out loud in a room full of people that I don't seem like I served. Um, I, I have a lot of grace for people who make comments like that, because I believe Brian that they don't know why it stings or how deeply it stings. Even something that as this, even something as simple as this, right? People will say to me like, "You're you're too pretty to have been in the military." That is totally meant as a compliment, right? But when people say it, it crushes my soul because our our country has this vision of what a veteran looks like and it's not me so not only am I dealing with not knowing who I am or what my purpose is but I'm I'm also now in community with people who I have to prove that to somehow does that make sense so, yeah so totally it's one infraction after another and it felt suffocating to me so Jen you found yourself almost giving up your military identity, your career identity, because other people were starting to make you feel uncomfortable about your career's worth of service to the country. That has to be a, a strange and difficult situation to deal with because that had been your persona that you identified with. It had been your purpose for so long. What, what kind of angst did that create for you? I think the same that it does for a lot of women veterans. Um, we we have data, Brian, that tells us that 
women veterans don't report themselves as veterans. Women veterans aren't using VA services. Um, I believe that it's directly correlated to what that feels like when you shed a uniform. If, if it became, it became hard for me to defend my service and I'm a chief and I did 20 years. Um, I, I can see how someone who maybe didn't leave the military with that level of rank, right. Or that level of confidence or, or, or maybe maybe they, they left the military on terms that were not theirs, like we did, right? I can completely understand how that becomes. It's just easier not to talk about, Brian. It's just easier not to talk about. So uh, I understand it for sure. All right. So at some point, you know, you're, you're living this civilian life now. You have a, a good job. Um, you're struggling with identity, uh, and you decide to apply to the George Bush Institute Veteran Leaders Program. So what, what inspired you to, to apply to that program? Because I needed something, because I needed something to fill that quiet space that was now creating this opportunity for me to think and feel and feel my feelings. Like I don't, you know what I mean? And so I was looking for some other, my, my drug of choice is achievement, Brian. It's not drinking or drugs. It's you know, what's the next thing can I run after to fill this space? And so through my transition, I had done a lot of, I built a LinkedIn profile. I had done a lot of connecting. Um, and Dwayne France, who was in the first VLP uh, cohort, posted something on LinkedIn and, um, and, to be honest with you, I didn't think there was any way on the face of the planet that I was qualified to do that program, but I have a habit of just throwing my name in the hat and seeing what happens, and that's exactly what I did. It was on a whim. Like, let's let's see how this pans out. And you get accepted to that program. You're in that program with 42 other, you know, veteran leaders from various backgrounds, pretty diverse group. Uh, all sharing thoughts on leadership and how we best take care of this population of military veterans moving forward. D did it fulfill your needs? Was it yeah. exactly what you were looking for? It did. That was, again, divine intervention, luck. You can call it whatever you want, but things have panned out for me sometimes at the in the nick of time, in the, the ver very exact space it needed to happen. And my acceptance to that program happened exactly when I needed it to happen. I, it was amazing, amazing, amazing experience. What I began to see pretty early on in that program is that I didn't have to wear a uniform to continue serving this country. Um, and Brian, once, once that realization started to kind of settle in with me, I started to feel better about where I was sitting. I was also very aware that there were things that I had packed in that box when I was in the military um, and I put them on a shelf and I'd been so busy that I didn't have time to deal with them. We moved to the next mission and moved to the next thing and moved to the next mission. But being in that program also gave me permission and I needed that. I needed permission to go take those boxes off the shelf um, and start to sort through some of that. I want to talk a little bit before we get into, you know, unpacking those boxes. You're in that program. You had to execute a, you know, personal leadership project. Can you talk a little bit about your project and partnering with, you know, the Institute for Veteran and Military Families, IVMF, out of University of Syracuse? and the survey that you conducted about women veterans and, and what the results were. So Brian, I didn't, uh, if you recall, we had to pitch to the Bush Institute what, what our idea was. My idea had zero to do with women veterans. In my role, in my civilian role, I work with a lot of partners who were who continue to ask me like, where do we find more of you? Where do we find more of you? Well, because you're in this space, you know what the, you know the answer to that. 
And so I was developing locally some programming to get civilian employers connected to um, folks that work out at Fort Meade. That's what I pitched to the Bush, Bush Institute. Um, and then I landed there. And then all of this transformation is kind of happening in my mind, in my heart. And I'm surrounded by people who are, are after seven months are reminding me like, hey, what you accomplished in the military is like kind of a big deal. Um, you should use your voice. If you feel like this, maybe other women feel like this. And that that is how this is kind of an organic journey. It started just that innocently, me listening to the folks that were in the program. And so you know this, the, the Bush Institute pushed pushed to us like, you need to go find the data. And so when I started doing research about women veterans and their transition journey, Brian, there's not a lot out there. Right. And so like, I'm a problem solver, right? And so I need data. There's not data. How can I get data? And we were lucky enough to have really amazing folks in the class, really amazing folks on the staff. Um, probably a team of about 10 of us worked. It took a couple months putting a survey together. Brian is like way harder than I thought. Um, and so we put together a um, 36 question survey for women veterans to kind of understand their transition journey. Um, and Brian, uh, I thought that survey would be taken by a couple hundred women and that it could validate the way I felt. Um, and it could validate some information that maybe I could share with the Bush Institute as we were finishing that program. But what happened was over a thousand women um, completed that survey. So by the time we were done with the formal portion of the program, we were just skimming the surface of getting that uh, getting that data together. Um, since that time, I've become like the expert on women veteran transition, uh, which is kind of comical to me. Uh, but I don't, I don't, I don't turn away an opportunity to talk to anyone who wants to talk to me about the experience that I think women veterans have as they transition, because I feel like for those, all of those women who took the time to share their stories with me, like I have an obligation to continue to voice that. Um, and you know, I don't like this, Brian, I don't like it, but people will listen to me because I was a chief. So where have you taken the results? What are you continuing to do? Are you pursuing this information? Are you sharing it? Are you writing about it? Where Where are you going with it? So, Brian, I shelved, um, I shelved that work for about four months. Um, I picked that back up at the beginning of this month. And so, so far, I've been working with the VA um, specifically their transition and economic development department, they have some really exciting work happening for women veterans. And so we've been partnering in conversation about what that looks like and uh, how I can help, how I can influence that. Um, I am uh, right now I'm working with, so getting the data analyzed, Brian, is also really, really hard. And there are about 10 different directions that you can take that. Some of those directions require a three-year commitment and a PhD, which I, you know, I have a, a day job. And so that's not in the cards for me. And frankly, I think the information needs to be out quickly, the longer it sits on a shelf. Um, so I'm working with a couple of folks to see how best to get that analyzed, that data analyzed. And then there's no, you know, I'm not the keeper of that. I don't want anything for that data. I want to get it into the hands of anyone, right? VSOs, people that want to hire veterans, whoever needs the data. I just want them to be able to make informed decisions about their programming. And I hope this will help. Yeah, I, I find that fascinating. Uh, the work you did in that project and, you know, the potential for enlightenment to come from that as, as people continue, the partners you've decided to work with and sharing that information and what it will lead to. Uh, and so I commend you. I mean, great work on your project, great work on finding partners to help you analyze that data. Uh, and it could lead for a tremendous amount of opportunities for women veterans moving forward. Um, Jen, I, you had mentioned unpacking boxes and a lot of that program at the Bush Institute uh, is spent on veteran health and wellness. Um, what, what 
transpired for you leaving that program from a health and wellness standpoint? You know, you said you needed to unpack some boxes. What what did you do to unpack those boxes? It gave you the space to do it. What what transpired? So, Brian, we talked about that sense of grief, loss, loss of identity, loss of purpose. That's kind of what started me on the journey to that was my clue that I needed to do something to figure out what was happening. We landed the Bush Institute, 42 people that I just absolutely respect and admire and look up to, many of whom, you know, shared with me their own personal journeys and how they came to find healing through therapy. So I started seeing um, a therapist um, and after about, Maybe about two months, Brian, she said to me, you know, I I really think that you would benefit from doing CPT, cognitive processing therapy. Um, And again, you know, my DNA is like, let's get after it. I want to solve whatever's wrong. I know something's wrong with me. I'm I'm not, I'm not contributing in a way that I can. I'm getting in my own way. So let's figure out what's going on. And uh, that, that's, that, that program uh, certainly changed my life. I believe, I believe the Bush Institute in conjunction with the treatment um, changed the tra- trajectory of my life uh, in the direction that I'm going, for sure, in a, in a really great way. So you're feeling good about opportunities for the future. What, what types of endeavors are you getting yourself into? I mean, you're a natural leader, Jen. Uh, where do you find interest now what do you want to be doing with your time and your your innate leadership abilities? I know this sounds uncanny. And I remember when I was transitioning and people would ask me, like, what do you want to do? And I would say to them, um, I want to be of service to others. And I took a lot of like bashing over the head about that because you can't, that's hard to put on a bullet on a resume, right? Right. Uh, But here I am, Brian, two years later, um, and I I am standing true in that. Like, my job on this planet is to serve other people, and I believe that with all of my heart and soul. Here's what's different now, is I believe there, the capability to do that, the number of jobs, right, you know, the number of volunteer opportunities, um, the number of people that you can touch, throughout your life Uh, it's infinite and so when people ask me like where do you see yourself in five years my answer really comfortably is I don't know and it's I don't know because I'm not like you're I'm not drawing a box around me I'm not shutting a door to an opportunity I'm not I'm just not going to do it and so I'm trusting the process this is a marathon not a sprint I'm working really hard to make myself the best version of me that I can do. And I'm deliberate about finding ways to serve other people in in whatever capacity that looks like. In my current role, I'm lucky enough to work in healthcare. Um, And that's a great, that is a great mission to be part of. Brian, I spend a lot of time speaking. um, And what happens is like I speak to a group and, and it, and two or three people will ask me like, hey, can you come talk to this group of folks or this group of folks? Um, and I find it, I, I didn't realize how, I don't think I real. I think when you serve, you don't realize how inspiring um, the work that we do is to people who don't serve. And so I, I've been really blessed. Like my cup is really full to share kind of what what veterans do, what they've done, what they've sacrificed, kind of what we're about. Um, I'm, I'm super happy doing that right now. And we'll see, like, you know, we'll see in five years. We'll see where I am. Well, I, I appreciate you sharing that, Jen. You know, the, the journey of transition is unique for everybody. Um, you have now found your voice. You're using your voice to promote that career, you're using that voice to promote women who choose a life of service in the military, and you're using that voice to promote military veterans post-service and the value they bring to communities. So finding your purpose in serving others, you know, I, I can only respect uh, that, 
as an endeavor you've taken on. Um, you know, many people talk about servant leadership. Uh, you are aspiring and are leading that as a theory of leadership. Um, so uh, I'm proud of you, Jen. I'm proud of the work you are doing now and you aspire to do. And I can't wait to watch this uh, trajectory you've set yourself on. Um, I know you're a speaker at an upcoming conference. I know the dates have shifted around, but it's um, Strategy 2020 or something like that. Can you can you talk a little bit about your your speaking opportunity and what that event is? So thank you very much. Uh, you know, the Bush Institute just gave me a place to find that voice. Thank you for all the super kind things that you said, Brian. That was like, I'm blushing over here if you can't see. So yeah, Brian, we're getting together in Seattle. Right now the target date is in October. And the goal really is to provide uh, a conference. It's for a day. There, there are a ton of really amazing people who are going to be there and it's to inspire it's to encourage people that no matter what you're going through no matter what circumstances life has dealt to you no matter how bad it looks right now um, here's a stage full of people who have struggled just like you and who have found a way to overcome that and so we're hoping that we can share that with with the folks that need it and we you know after this crisis we hope is going to be a great time to bring people together to have those conversations. I, I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, I have no doubt a lot of people coming out of this are going to need inspiration. They're going to need empowerment uh, as we all figure out what our futures look like. Uh, so that conference, uh, it's taking place in Seattle in October time frame. And, uh, you know, I looked at the list of, of keynote speakers and there's there's some talent for sure. That, yeah. uh, that's on that list. Is the target audience military veterans, military spouses? Who's the audience? It is business leaders, executives, former NFL players. So, Brian, I don't know if you've thought about that, but peop uh, you know, people who play in the NFL experience the same kind of transition uh, journey that we do. Loss of self, loss of identity, okay. loss of purpose, labor. right? Um, uh, s certainly folks who find themselves at a crux um, in life where they're where where we can classify that as transition. What does that mean? Right? A transition in your personal life, a transition in your professional life. Um, the more the merrier is what I would tell you. And for folks that are interested in seeing the lineup, they can head out to the website. It's vision2020.com. Um, great, great, great folks put it together. And it's been, I just feel honored. I feel honored to be invited to speak at that. And I feel like I'm going to get as much at that conference than hopefully what I'm able to give, you know, with a half an hour or so I'm on stage. Yeah, I, I find that to often be the case. You know, you you show up at things like that and you're on the receiving end more than you are the delivering end. Uh, but that, that just takes an open mind and, and I think a little bit of empathy when you show up to those types of things to understand where people are coming from. You know, you mentioned professional athletes uh, and I've had a lot of conversations about the parallels between professional athletes uh, and people who depart the military, that transition of clearly identified role, responsibility, purpose, and identity. You know, they're celebrities and they've got to figure out what they're going to do for the protracted longevity of their life post, a, you know, an athletic career. Um, so there are parallels there. Um, so bringing folks like that to talk about uh, how they have successfully transitioned beyond that identity they can remain proud of that identity for sure. And that's a conversation yes. I have with a lot of people. Like be proud of your military service, carry that military service or that athletic career forward, but you got to identify and define who you're going to be for the rest of your life. And your identity can't be what you were yesterday. There's got to be a vision for who you're going to be in the future, you know, and that starts right now and it starts with looking forward always um so it sounds like a pretty interesting conference that uh i'm certain will empower inspire a lot of people and again kudos to you for for being a part of something like that using your voice and and propping people up especially as we come out of this COVID 19 crisis across the country i think so many people 
are going to be looking for inspiration like that. So Jen, I, I want to ask you, uh, and I love to ask this question to people, what are you reading now to enlighten yourself? <laughs> so I was old school before COVID and I wanted to have a book in my hand. I have moved to audiobooks, and Brian, I'm like, why haven't I been doing that more? I, I'm kicking myself now, right? That I haven't embraced, uh, I haven't embraced the technology. Um, so I have a couple of things going. It's kind of, I feel like it's kind of like music, right? It depends on what mood you're in. Yeah. So, um, there, there's an author, Glennon Doyle. She wrote Eat, Love, Pray. When you talk about life transition, like this girl did it. If you don't know her, I need you to go look her up. Okay. She just released a book called Untamed. Untamed. She, uh, she reads the, you know, she, uh, she reads the book, right? It's in her voice. And it's been awesome, like super awesome to, to uh, listen to. I also did a thing around a book. Have you ever been part of a book club before? I have. Well, I have not. Okay. And so I, uh, I just started a book club. We are reading uh, Struggling Well, um, Growth in the Aftermath of Trauma. And uh, I don't know how much you know about the book or they got, you know, Ken Falk and uh, Josh, Josh Goldberg um, wrote the book. They, they're doing a lot of work in the veteran space, but um, it's about post-traumatic growth. Okay. And it's about how there is strength in the struggle, right? Uh, the forward of the book is, um, is by uh, uh, Charlie Plum, POW, okay. Navy captain. Eight years, right? Eight years he spent at the Hilton. And um, when you hear his voice and you hear him say that eight years he was in an eight by eight cell. And today he's living a life full of purpose, uh, full of fulfillment. He's content. And he draws a straight line between that to the struggle that he experienced for eight years. Like, it's just blowing my mind, right? Right. Like there's purpose in the heartache, the struggle, the tough times, um, and and you can do good with that. And so I'm really enjoying listening to that too. Yeah, I'm I'm certainly going to have to look for that book, and and I'm, I'll enjoy that for sure. Um, Jen, what are you doing from a health and wellness perspective? You know, we spend a lot of time encouraging people to get out, maintain healthy lifestyles. Are you? I, you were an avid runner. Are you still an avid runner? Um, uh, so I'm trying to run, right? I'm trying to get out and run. Um, member of a, of, a, of a couple of gyms, right? COVID shut that down. So you have to get, you have to get creative. Um, I've converted to the life of Pel Peloton. And so I have a cool bike, which is really important to me. Um, I live in an area where it's real easy for me to get outside and be outdoors without being in proximity, close proximity to people. And I make a habit of doing that every day. Part of that is about my physical well-being, Brian. But part of that is because I know how immensely important that is to my well-being as a whole. So I, I am, uh, I make it, you know, I make it a habit. It's certainly a habit. Well, Jen, I just want to, again, thank you for joining us on the podcast, for sharing your story, a little bit of your struggle, making yourself uh, vulnerable um, to share your transition process uh, that I think many people can draw from. It, it's a process. There's time that's got to heal. It's, you've got to take space, create space for you to enable yourself to define who you're going to be in the future. And I appreciate the fact that you are in the arena of inspiring others, using your voice, telling your story, making yourself vulnerable so that others can learn and be inspired from you. So again, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I look forward to continuing to watch the work you do. And, uh, and thanks for, for sharing with us today. Thank you so much for being such a great friend to me. Um, I'm, I, I admire the work that you're doing in Idaho with Mission 43. I know you're changing lives, Brian. Um, and today was really awesome. It was really awesome to be able to spend some time with you. I want to thank Jen Anthony for joining us on this episode of the Mission 43 podcast and sharing her vulnerable story of transition from the military. 
I think so many of us can probably relate to elements of Jen's story. Uh, we look forward to continuing this series and bringing more thought leaders from around the country to the Mission 43 podcast. So stay tuned. Thank <laughs> you.